Greetings, friends. Um, in this short little video, we want to take a little bit of a closer look at this chart that you would have seen in a previous video, the um, different ways in which um, research methodologies relate to uh, strategies that you might choose to collect and analyze information, also with an underlying worldview that is often associated with that particular kind of methodology. Now, these aren't always the case. It necessarily mean that if you do quantitative research, you have a modernist philosophical worldview or you're evidencing it. But oftentimes these do go together. So in a previous video, we explored the relationship between a particular worldview and a methodology that may go along with it. And um, in this video, we want to take a, um, a look at an example of how, of how this might work. So First, we want to take a look at um, a few qualitative research studies and to see the ways in which um, a, a, um, a postmodern worldview is evidenced by the way that the researcher went about looking at that. So, in the first video, the uh, first article we want to take a look at, it's called Critical Race Theory. Um, The, uh, the authors of the study wanted to take a look at how campus climate um, affects the way in which certain students are able to uh, perform, achieve at that, at that institution. And what we wanted to do is, is not so much take a look at the specifics of the study, but take a look at it, the methodological framework used for the study and um, also the um, the methodology that was used to collect and analyze the data. And that those two go together and will go together in your study. The research methodology you choose will be large to a large degree determined by the kind of question that you ask and to a certain extent the way you look at the world. So in this instance, what the authors wanted to do is take a look at the way that what they call subtle insults, uh, verbal, nonverbal, and or visual those insults who are directed towards people of color and the effects that they have on individuals in those systems. And it says here that they're going to use critical race theory as their framework. Now that might be a phrase that you're not familiar with, but critical race theory is a, a, a particular kind of way of looking at the world and what goes on in the world. And what it looks for are subtle yet consistent kinds of ways that particular ideas are expressed in the culture and often find them way, the ways into systems, into policies, into practices, budgets, and all kinds of ways that those uh, underlying, um, underlying uh, values and ways that people connect themselves are evidenced in practice. So if you have that worldview, if you believe that there are these other kinds of forces that are at work, then oftentimes those aren't revealed just by a simple study, a quantitative study where you're asking a survey. Sometimes you have to dig deep. And if those are the kinds of things that you believe exist, then the best way to find that out oftentimes is some kind of a qualitative study where you're doing interviews or you're looking at print materials and you're forming opinions based on what you see and what you hear. And so in this instance, these individuals conducted a study that way. And if you were to go through the article, you won't see very many numbers. You won't see data expressed in numerical form but what you will see are, uh, are interviews and the results of those interviews and uh, quotes from individuals who were, were studied. Sometimes there will be a graph that helps to uh, uh, demonstrate what a person is, is thinking about. But this is an example of all those aspects coming together in one place at one time. So here's a postmodernistic view of the world qualitative research. We're going to ask people's opinions. The specific name of that method is called grounded theory. Another example, article called Girls Can Play. Same kind of approach, but in addition to critical theory, there's feminist and post-structural theory. And again, these are very technical terms that exist in the 
philosophical literature. It's not our purpose to unpack them, except to say that you know what feminism is. It's a way of looking at the world through the eyes of gender and gender relationships. Post-structural is a way of looking at the world where our um, assumptions about structures have fallen apart and we don't believe that the world is as neat and orderly as we once did. And critical theory, again, is a way of looking at the world where people examine political, underlying political and um, oftentimes economic forces as a way of shaping how people act in the world. And again, you can see the same kind of thing. It's with that methodology, uh, interviews were conducted. And again, you don't see, uh, here's, uh, um, you don't see uh, surveys oftentimes, you see interviews and they talk about how many people were interviewed, how many girls were interviewed and how long does the interviews last. And again, at the end, um, what you'll see is um, a lot of quotes from the interviews, uh, either um, little phrases that were used or sometimes, sometimes a whole paragraphs. But the idea is to take information in the form of words and pictures and then to organize that information and then be able to express it. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that's a form of a a worldview that views the world as not quite so neat, quite so clean. You can't reduce everything to a number. Um, you have to get the subtle nuances of the way that life is. And the best way to do that is to collect information in a lot of different, a lot of different forms. Contrast that with a quantitative approach, where things are um, reduced to numbers, to some kind of um, numerical expression. And so in this, in this instance, um, the authors wanted to assess the importance of educational goals. And so they, in their, in their um, abstract, they talk about how they were going to go about accumulating the information and how they're going to process it. Here, they're going to use an independent samples t-test, and we'll learn how to do that in this class. Um, and in going about conducting the study, this, same kind of approach, you review the literature and you put a purpose statement in there, but then you start to see in the way that the articles are constructed, um, all, all the data coming in the form of numbers. Here's the, the survey that they would use. But then all of a sudden you start to see charts and, and notice the precision with which these charts are constructed. Here's a, numer a number taken out to four decimal places. That indicates a an, an assumption about the kind of precision that you can achieve with um, with these kind of numbers. Now, our qualitative folks would say this is kind of a bunch of hooey. N nothing in life can be expressed with that kind of precision outside of measurements of the physical world. If you're if you are measuring people's opinions, then well, I mean, it depends on maybe how the test question was constructed or how the person was feeling at that day. But to think that you can have this kind of precision is, is a little bit ambitious intellectually, but that's the, um, that's the way that qualitative researchers, or sorry, quantitative researchers um, function. They believe in these numbers and they believe that they can get accurate information and um, have reasonable confidence that what they are studying can actually be discerned uh, numerically, or discerned and expressed numerically. Here's another article. Uh, principles perception of politics in the workplace and again a survey is used and data collected and when you get to the point where you're expressing it here here's all the numerical expressions of, of attitudes and opinions and you can compare these numbers relative to each other and um, you can see some numbers are significantly different than others and you can infer certain things um, on the basis of those differences. So uh, when people express themselves quantitatively, there's a certain kind of a confidence that they have that these processes actually reflect what people really think. And there's probably is something to that. The qual folks would have um, little difficulty in accepting the precision with which the quant people express things, but there's probably something something there. And even the qualitative pe quantitative people, excuse me, will you know, hedge their their assertions by talking about the limitations of the study and what can and can't be learned with this kind of methodology. So what I wanted to do in this video is just to give you um, a very simple kind of way of, of looking at the ways in which these kind of questions 
operationalize themselves in actual studies. So when you're choosing a research methodology for yourself, you'll be making some decisions about what kind of uh, methodology would best answer the kind of questions that you're asking. So if you're asking opinion questions and all you want is the answers or you want behavioral kind of questions, how often people do things or choices, there's a, very, there's a, there's a place for quantitative research. And we'll show you some very efficient and effective and simple ways of collecting quantitative data and organizing it. And there's a cool little spreadsheet that we can use to crunch some numbers and we can give you some numbers that will take out to as many decimal places as you like and give you that kind of precision. But those are questions. Um, those are, um, it's a methodology that's used if you're wanting to deal with observable behavior or opinions that can be expressed in the form of a survey. If you want to dig a little deeper, if you want to dig a little deeper into, um, into um, people's motives for doing things or explanations that might not be apparent on the surface, or if you have a, uh, a particular worldview that is more in line with postmodernist thinking, um, if you believe in things like critical theory or race theory or gender theory, those kind of things you want to explore, then oftentimes qualitative research is a, a methodology that works best for you.